Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 81, Sun from Another World. World of the Gods, Labyrinth City Orario, Guild. The Guild in the World of the Gods is an organization that manages all the familias while also providing various services to adventurers. One of the main goals of the Guild is to manage the threat posed by monsters created by the dungeon. In a city like Orario, with a dungeon within it, the Guild becomes a crucial organization. As mentioned before, the guild manages and trains adventurers entering the dungeon. It also purchases loot collected by adventurers, and another of its functions is to maintain the Orario, whose purpose is to prevent monsters from escaping the dungeon. Hestia, of course, knew about this. Therefore, if she wanted to form a family, she had to be registered and recognized by the guild first. So, this is the guild. After walking for about 15 minutes, both Hestia and Hephaestus arrived at the guild. With enthusiasm, Hestia entered and looked at a large spacious area with several counters. Adventurers were constantly entering, and many of them were talking to their advisors. Come on, don't get ahead of yourself. With heavy steps, Hephaestus followed Hestia, who was already looking around. She really couldn't handle Hestia's enthusiasm. Quick, Hephaestus. Fine, calm down, the guild isn't going anywhere. But the employees might. Shaking her head, Hephaestus joined Hestia, who was in line, waiting for her turn. Welcome to the guild. My name is Inna. Is there anything I can help you with? After a few minutes of waiting, a girl with a slim body, pointed ears, short brown hair, and beautiful emerald eyes with glasses attended to them. A professional smile could be seen on her face as she looked at Hestia and Hephaestus. Hestia looked at her for a moment before nodding. Due to the pointed ears, she wasn't human, but she wasn't an elf either, given the short length of her ears. Half-elf. This was the lower world, after all, where various races lived. One of these races was the elves. We came to register a new family. While Hestia was lost in thought, it was Hephaestus who responded. She saw that her friend's bad habit was surfacing. Of course, Hephaestus Sama, it's for Hestia Sama, right don't worry, the guild has already been notified. Bowing slightly, Inna recognized Hephaestus, being a goddess with quite some fame. As for Hestia, the guild had already been informed about her descent, as well as her appearance, so Inna wasn't surprised. Yes. I want to register the Hestia Familia, which will soon be the strongest family in Aurario. Clenching her fist, Hestia smiled dazzlingly. When she said those words, several adventurers turned to look at her. Hephaestus wanted to escape, she shrank a bit from embarrassment while looking around, afraid of being involved with this foolish goddess. Ha <laughs> ha. Smiling stiffly, Inna was also a bit surprised by her declaration. Although it wasn't uncommon for gods to aim to be the best family, it should be noted that Hestia was a newcomer, and with the Freya and Loki familias in Orario, Many people just rolled their eyes at Hestia. However, Hestia didn't mind. She put both hands on her hips and proudly puffed out her chest. Cough, cough. So, Hestia-sama, if you could fill out this form. With a fake cough, Inna drew Hestia's attention, who was drowning in her ego. Oh, of course. Coming out of her ego, Hestia quickly filled out the form. She slightly stuck out her tongue while filling in all the blanks as quickly as she could before handing it back to Inna. All right, with this, we can welcome the Hestia family to Aurario. Hmm. Looking at the registration document in her hand, Inna frowned. Is something wrong? Feeling suspicious, Hestia tilted her head. Hephaestus also looked at Inna, as a single registration form shouldn't have any problems. No. It's just, Hestia Sama, you are a goddess who has just descended, right? Yes, that's right. Then may I ask, how long has it been since Hestia Sama descended? Hmm, about two hours. Answering naturally, Hestia looked at Inna before turning to look at Hephaestus, who just touched her face in exhaustion. Inna, however, was speechless. Usually, every time a god descended, the guild would be informed a week in advance. Then the god would have to wait for the Dinatus before registering their family with the guild. But here was Hestia, who had just descended, already naturally registering her family. However, even though it was rare, 
there was something else that made Ina frown. If that's the case, then Hestia-sama shouldn't have any members in her familia yet. That was what bothered Ina. In the family members section, Hestia had filled in that space with a name. This confused Ina a lot, and she was wondering if this was some kind of joke by Hestia. No, you're mistaken, my familia already has a member. Opening her eyes with surprise, Hephaestus turned to look at Hestia. Wait a moment, Hestia. You just descended, and I've been with you all this time. How have I not seen that member of yours? As Hephaestus said, for an adventurer to join a family, they first had to receive the blessing of a god. However, Hestia had just descended, and Hephaestus had accompanied her until now. Therefore, there was no member who had joined her familia yet. Inna was also very surprised. Even the most famous god in Orario couldn't get their first family member in a few hours after descending, not to mention Hestia, who had a reputation for being a lazy goddess. Who said my child is in this world? With a smile on her face, Hestia crossed her arms when she said those words. Both Inna and Hephaestus opened their mouths in shock. Inna might not know what those words meant, but Hephaestus did. She knew that there were many more worlds, and the universe and multiverse were infinite. Therefore, having children in other worlds was not impossible, but it was very rare so rare that currently in this world, there was no other god who had children in other worlds. Hestia. You. But what do I see here if it isn't the chibi goddess? Before Hephaestus could continue questioning, a voice interrupted. Entering through the guild door was a woman with light red hair tied in a ponytail. Her eyes were also red, and she mainly wore male clothing, with jeans and a crop top that showed her stomach. Following her were also three women, whom Inna recognized instantly. Loki Familia. Murmuring softly, Inna looked at the newcomers. This woman was the goddess Loki, the goddess of deception, as well as one of the goddesses with the strongest familia in all of Orario. Chapter 82, My Son is a Champion. But what do I see here, if it isn't the chibi goddess? Turning her head, Hestia furrowed her brow, she knew the woman who had just entered very well. It's you. What do you want? It was evident from Hestia's furrowed brow and disapproving look that Loki wasn't very welcome. Loki, however, just smiled before the other three girls accompanying him caught up. Nothing. I just heard that a certain chibi goddess was descending. Ha ha ha, but from what I see, the rumors are true. So what have you found members for your family of course not, ha ha ha. A vein popped on Hestia's forehead at Loki's words. She narrowed her eyes before saying, you're just a flat-chested goddess, as flat in the heavens as you'll be in the underworld, ha ha ha. What did you say? What you heard, ironing board. Growling at each other, both touched their foreheads while grinding their teeth. On the other hand, Hephaestus sighed. It was the same thing again. Loki and Hestia were rivals in the heavens, and it seemed they would continue to be so in the underworld. So, shrugging, Hephaestus looked at the three girls following Loki, recognizing them instantly. One of them was a very beautiful woman with long golden hair and golden eyes, dressed only in a black and white battle cloth that highlighted her slender figure. The other two were twins, with black hair and brown eyes, dressed in very revealing clothes, clearly indicating their Amazon race. Despite being twins, there was something that distinguished them, and that was that one of the sisters had a well-endowed chest. There they go again. Ha it never changes. While both sisters shook their heads, the golden-haired girl only tilted her head with interest. Looking at the trio, Hephaestus merely nodded, they were clearly from Loki's family. Their names were Diona Hiriot, Shin Hiriot, and Ace Wallenstein, all famous and powerful adventurers in Orario. HMP. I won't argue with a chibi who probably won't find a family member. Turning her head annoyed, Loki glanced sideways at Hestia, waiting for her next expression. However, instead of the irritated reaction she expected, Hestia looked at her with a cheeky smile. He he too bad for you, Loki. I've already found members for my family. Patting her chest with pride, Hestia looked at her disdainfully. Ha you've already found a member where is he? Looking around for the adventurer who bravely decided to join her family, there was no one. She then turned her gaze to Hephaestus, expecting an answer, but Hephaestus just shook her head. 
Where is Chibi? How come I don't see him? HMP. He's not here at the moment. Oh, are you lying to me, Chibi? Or maybe your son was so embarrassed that he ran away. Ha ha ha. With a hand over her mouth, Loki mocked Hestia. She didn't believe a word, Hestia just arrived in the underworld, and she already has a member in her dreams. No. He would never do that, however, Hestia frowned deeply as she stared at Loki. Loki, on the other hand, raised her eyebrows at this. Has she already found a family member? After years of knowing each other, Loki knew that Hestia wasn't lying, not after seeing her expression. But despite being surprised, she just shrugged. Doesn't matter, my kids are better. With that in mind, Loki mocked her again. Well, don't get so worked up. After all, your kids can never compare to mine, right, my dear ins. Turning her head to the blonde-haired woman, Loki smiled proudly. As a first-class adventurer, Loki had a lot to brag about. However, once again, she was disappointed. He he he. Because this time, it was Hestia who looked proudly at her. With a smile on her face, Hestia swelled her chest with pride. My son is the strongest in all of Aurario, no one can beat him. With her head held high, Hestia uttered those words that probably attracted hatred and offended all the families in Aurario. Loki, Hephaestus, and Inna opened their mouths in shock, while Tiona and Shin couldn't help but give another look to the chibi goddess in front of them. As for Inns, curiosity was piqued by those words, particularly by the phrase no one can beat him those words carried weight. Hey, Chibi, it's okay to brag about your son, but don't exaggerate. Even Loki could see that Hestia was exaggerating, after all, the strongest adventurer belonged to the Freya Familia. Loki had to admit this. I'm not exaggerating, it's the truth. However, Hestia didn't give up. She knew what kind of being her son was, so it wasn't an exaggeration to say he was the strongest mortal in the world. But if she said those words, Loki would treat her like a madwoman and mock her. That's why she claimed he was the strongest in all of Aurario. After all, she wasn't wrong. Really what kind of son do you have to brag like that? Frowning, Loki narrowed her eyes, she felt both curious and angry. Angry because she found out what kind of person Hestia managed to capture, and angry because Hestia completely ignored Inns, a level 5 adventurer, as if she were just an ordinary one. As if expecting this question, Hestia smiled sweetly. Listen well, because I'll only say it once. With a hint of suspense in her voice, Hestia looked at the entire group. Hephaestus also looked at Hestia, very curious to know what kind of son she had in another world. Inna was the same, knowing almost 90% of the adventurers, she knew that the title of the strongest belonged to the Freya Familia. Tiona and Shin approached, their faces showing curiosity and some anger. Hestia saw them as if they were nothing in front of her son, sparking their curiosity. As for Inns, he moved his hair away from his ears and narrowed his eyes. If this chibi goddess's son was the strongest and invincible, he wanted to meet him. My son is a champion. Eh. With a proud smile, Hestia looked at Loki, who now had a shocked, stiff body. Both she and Hephaestus had widened their eyes at this revelation. Others might not know the significance of that title, but they did. As goddesses, they knew very well the weight that title carried. So, Loki just opened her mouth before a scream escaped her. Eh. <sighs> Chapter 83, Champion. What? Staring at Loki in astonishment, Hestia watched with satisfaction. For centuries, she had wanted to witness that expression on Loki's face, and now she had achieved it. Loki, however, didn't divert her gaze from Hestia, she was genuinely surprised. Champion what's that? Is it some tournament title? Looking at each other, Tiona and Jin asked the dumbfounded Loki. Still, Loki ignored them. Inna was also puzzled, she didn't know what a champion was, but judging by Loki's exaggerated reaction, it seemed to be a significant deal. Eyes was in the same boat, she didn't know what a champion was. However, the title brought an invisible, powerful pressure that furrowed her brow. Hephaestus, equally baffled as Loki, looked at Hestia with great astonishment. Hestia. You. Pointing with a trembling finger, Hephaestus struggled to speak. After all, 
if what Hestia said was true, then becoming the most powerful family in Aurario wouldn't be an exaggeration, becoming the most powerful family in the world would be more appropriate. You're lying. Chibi, you're a liar. Shaking her head vehemently, Loki refused to believe her. After all, a champion was so rare that Loki had only known one in millions of years. She knew well what a champion was capable of, and the mere recollection sent shivers down her spine. Hump. I guess the truth is too much for a flat-chested like you. You. Turning her head slightly annoyed, Hestia didn't bother with Loki anymore. She had spoken the truth, whether Loki believed it or not was up to her. Loki, however, just gritted her teeth. HMP. I'll see for myself then. Tiona, Chin, eyes, let's go. Turning around without looking back, Loki strode away, refusing to stay a minute longer in that place. Wait for me, Loki. Swiftly following was the trio. However, before leaving, Eyes gave a meaningful look to Hestia. Her curiosity was piqued, now she wanted to meet this champion. Watching the group leave quickly, a bitter smile formed on Hephaestus's face. Hestia. What you don't believe me either, Hephaestus looking at her with a furrowed brow, Hestia was upset. No I believe you. Quickly denying her words, Hephaestus sighed. It's just that a champion is not someone tied to a god. This was the key part, after all, a champion is loved by the world. It's a being that carries victory on its shoulders, someone whose power can even surpass that of the gods. It's someone too grand for a god to have in their family. This is why Loki didn't believe Hestia because a champion was too rare, too strong, too significant, and, of course, someone who had saved the world. I know, but believe me, Hephaestus, I have a child like that. Letting out a tired sigh, Hestia shrugged. She saw the look in Hephaestus's eyes tenderness and clear longing, as if her lover had gifted her a beautiful diamond while proposing marriage. Tethys. Hestia-sama. Can we continue? Scratching her cheek, Inna didn't know what else to say. She had overheard their conversation, and from what she gathered, this news would bring chaos to all of Aurario. Of course. Looking again at the forgotten Inna, Hestia responded with a smile. HMP. Cursed Chibi. Even with gritted teeth, Loki couldn't help but curse Hestia. She was furious because, if what the Chibi said was true, then she had nothing to boast about. No matter how powerful Eyes was or what potential she held, in the face of a champion, even a legendary hero would have to admit inferiority. Because a champion knows no bounds. So. What is a champion could you tell us, Loki? Hands behind her head, Tiona asked while blinking several times. Like everyone else, she didn't know what a champion meant, but seeing Loki so angry, she knew it couldn't be something insignificant. Glancing at Tiona for a moment, Loki sighed. I suppose there's no harm if you know. Shaking her head, Loki began to recall various things from the past. For gods, champions were living legends. With a hand on her face, Loki looked at Eyes, who was staring intently. Shin also watched, but unlike Eyes, who was hungry for knowledge, Shin was merely curious, like any other adventurer. To begin with, what do you think of heroes? Listening to these words, the trio couldn't help but exchange glances. A hero is someone who has written their own legend, brave and kind. A hero is someone who saves people. They are powerful. Agreeing with Tiona's responses, Loki was satisfied. Good. What you said is correct. Now, think of the most powerful hero you can imagine, anyone, just think of it. Hmm. Tilting their heads, the three girls soon recalled a legend, of a certain silver-haired boy. As for eyes, she also thought of a very special being, one that made her eyes widen. Now, multiply that hero you thought of by 1000, and that's a champion. Someone whose existential value is equal to or greater than a thousand heroes. Eh. Opening their eyes in shock, the trio looked at Loki, who now had a bitter smile on her face. Impossible. Does someone like that even exist? Exactly. That's impossible. Shaking their heads, Tiona and Jin stared at Loki. I know, but it's true. Although they are very, very rare, they exist. 
Now understand a champion is not just about power or goodness. A champion never loses, they cannot lose. When everyone else fails, they won't. They are the last defense of the world, growing without limits, surpassing even the powers of us gods. Swallowing hard, the trio listened attentively to Loki's words, unable to help but be amazed. Someone who cannot lose is impressive on its own, but champions being the last defense of the world, a champion who loses means a destroyed world. So. Hestia Sama. Does she have someone like that in her family? With trembling words, Shin now understood why Loki and Hephaestus reacted that way. Although she didn't want to believe it, it was Loki who spoke those words. I don't know, but... With a sigh, Loki turned her head with a furrowed brow, looking at the already distant guild headquarters. If it's true, then Orario will enter chaos. With their presence, many gods will be jealous. Having this legendary being is enormous, and perhaps the most powerful family belongs to that chibi. Looking also toward the distant guild headquarters, eyes engraved Loki's words in her mind. Champion. A deep longing emerged within her. With just those words, she was determined to meet this legendary being. Loki's words were right, after all, several adventurers overheard their conversation with Hestia. So, the news that Hestia had a champion in her family spread quickly to all the families in Orario, even to that goddess in the Babel Tower. Orario had descended into chaos, yet the champion was still not present. Chapter 84, Party However, while all of this was unfolding in the world of the gods, Yuki had no remote idea that his arrival was eagerly anticipated in that world. But that's another story, for now, Yuki was looking at Kai, standing in front of him. Our resources and armaments have been depleting due to the recent missions. Therefore, we've decided to find a partner to assist us in our cause. I understand. So, you've finally decided to venture into that area, Guy. With a small yawn, Yuki wasn't surprised. This was within his calculations. After all, even though Undertaker had money, it lacked the means to transport weapons and equipment, and no one to sell them to. GHQ wouldn't permit such dealings, selling weapons to Undertaker would only spell more trouble for GHQ. That's why if Undertaker wants to continue its operations, it needs external help someone with significant influence and money. Right, it's time for Undertaker to start forming its own network of connections. And. Who is our partner? Okanaka Haurun. Dash dash. Okanaka Haurun was the director of the richest and most powerful conglomerate in Japan, making Guy's choice very feasible. With significant influence in Japan, the possibility of obtaining weapons, provisions, and other technology was very high. Okanaka Haurun was the perfect sponsor for Undertaker. However, there was a problem. Okina was elusive. Being highly influential, he was closely monitored by GHQ. Okina had to keep his whereabouts secret, otherwise, things would get very interesting. But, isn't this party too convenient, guy? While putting on a black tuxedo, Yuki gave Guy a blank look. It was too coincidental that, at this very moment, Okanaka Haurun decided to throw a party. They were currently on a private boat sailing in waters outside the quarantine zone. Hey. You're right, but it's also very convenient for us. More than convenient, it's like he's inviting us. With that in mind, Yuki saw Guy in a white tuxedo. With a sigh, Yuki grabbed the collars of two unconscious people on the floor. They had knocked these people out to infiltrate this boat. Although Yuki could transform, he decided to follow Guy's orders. There was something very interesting on this boat. By the way, thanks for accompanying me. Giving a smile to Yuki, Guy patted his shoulder. If he had to say, convincing Okina to sponsor a terrorist group would be very difficult. Still, now with Yuki's presence, the difficulty dropped significantly. Yuki was famous, after all. Don't worry. In reality, Yuki didn't want to come to this party. He wanted to stay at the base with Inori and Tsugumai. Being in their arms was better than being among these unfamiliar people. But he changed his mind after seeing a message on the old phone. Our target will attend a party outside the quarantine zone. Yuki didn't know how Seagai obtained this information, but if you overlook his twisted personality, Seagai was reliable, as long as his motives were exposed. 
That's why Yuki decided to come to this party. He wanted to see this person with his own eyes and, at the same time, bring her under his control. Yuki didn't want to put all his cards on Seagai. After all, you never know when things can go wrong. It's always better to have a backup plan. Are you ready? Um, let's go. A long night awaits us. Exiting the room, Yuki closed his eyes slightly before opening them again. This time, both eyes were black. After all, Yuki didn't want to draw attention with his eyes one red and the other golden. These eyes could be considered Yuki's mark, or rather, the Reaper's mark. Oh, how elegant. It's been a while since I've been to one of these. Looking at all the people dressed very elegantly, Yuki remembered some events from his first life. Have you attended parties like this, darling? Um, in the past. Listening to Tsugumai's voice on the communicator, Yuki responded. Tsugumai, on the other hand, had doubts. Due to Yuki's personality, she knew that if it weren't for Guy, he wouldn't attend these gatherings. Come back soon. I will. Inorai, who was also with Tsugumai, said. For her, it was better if these parties ended quickly. She wanted to sleep, and Yuki was her cuddly pillow. Tsugumai just rolled her eyes at this. She also knew that Inorai liked to sleep with Yuki. It complicated their nights of passion. After all, the little perverted couple had to wait until Inorai fell asleep to take action. This caused them to lack sleep the next day. Well, that happened to Tsugumai, Yuki, on the other hand, was just sexually frustrated. After all, Tsugumai always got tired quickly, leaving Yuki wanting more. It's been 10 years since GHQ took over the administration of our country. However, as they had their conversation, an old man stood in the center of the hall, giving a stirring speech to everyone present. So, that's Okina. Immediately recognizing the old man, Yuki put a hand on his chin. The old man dressed very elegantly, and the aura surrounding him was very unusual. Now then. Where are you, my dear Haruka? Giving only a brief glance at Okina, Yuki decided to search for his target. There you are. Fortunately for Yuki, finding her wasn't very difficult. Haruka Uma this was the name of Yuki's target. She was a beautiful young woman with brown hair and brown eyes. She dressed very elegantly, just like everyone else at the party. However, there was something that set her apart from the other guests. Smiling slightly, Yuki decided to set his plan in motion. Hmm. However, someone else also caught his attention. It was a very elegant young woman with long blonde hair and reddish brown eyes. Like Haruka, she was also very beautiful. However, unlike Haruka, several men were trying to invite her to dance. She must be Arisika Haurun. Hee <laughs> hee, interesting, interesting. Yuki had found a big fish, after all, Arisa was Okina's granddaughter, so her influence at this party was not small. Smiling like a mischievous imp, Yuki alternated his gaze between Haruka and Arisa, and various thoughts crossed his mind. Yuki had to apologize to Inorai later because tonight was destined to be very long. Chapter 85, Armadillo Several minutes had passed. Yawn. Opening his mouth in a sign of boredom, Yuki glanced sideways at Okina. This old man had been talking non-stop. While Yuki agreed that introductions were important, this old man was simply giving a life lesson. We, the people of Japan, must lift our heads and stand on our own two feet. Only then can we prevent GHQ from continuing to rule. For a free Japan. Cheers. Cheers. Applause, applause. Ending his lengthy presentation, Okina raised his wine glass high, quickly followed by the guests. The sound of applause echoed throughout the hall. Rolling his eyes, Yuki looked at old Okina. He had to admit that, despite the long speech, the old man had very high charisma. Many guests seemed quite pleased with his talk. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to dance. Eh. What? Waving his hand, Yuki left Guy with his mouth wide open. After all, they were supposed to be on a mission, and Yuki was supposed to accompany Guy to talk to Okina. But Yuki had other plans. Shaking his head, Guy sighed. I guess the mission depends on me. Watching Okina return to his private place accompanied by guards, 
Guy put on a bitter smile. In the end, it all depended on him. Dash. Darling, weren't you on a mission? Tsugumai was also surprised. She didn't know why Yuki wanted to dance, but her jealousy flared up. Lately, my body has been very stiff, so I thought a little dance would be good for my muscles. What's with that pathetic excuse Yuki, tell me what you're planning. Rolling her eyes at this, Tsugumai didn't buy his excuse. Stiff body good for his muscles if that were the case, then in bed, he wouldn't move his hips as if there were no tomorrow. Um, relax, Yuki. Contrary to Tsugumai, Inorai agreed. She thought that Yuki hadn't rested lately, and it was normal for his body to experience other side effects, not to mention the apocalypse virus in his body. So Inorai agreed with Yuki. Inorin are you agreeing? Turning her gaze in complete amazement, Tsugumai stared wide-eyed at Inorai. After all, Inorai was giving her permission for Yuki to be with another woman besides her. Um, no problem. Do you believe me now even Inorai agrees? Growling. Gritting her teeth and growling, Tsugumai was very upset. She didn't understand why Inorai was supporting it, but from her experience, she knew that Yuki was a womanizer. She was already sharing him with Inorai, so sharing him with another woman wasn't something Tsugumai liked. However, in the end, she just shrugged and gave up. She was very pensive because she knew Yuki had been very frustrated lately. Although she knew it was her fault, it's not like she had Yuki's monstrous endurance. She looked at Inorai again and wondered if Inorai also had high endurance. But she quickly shook her head. Inorai's body looked very delicate, so much so that it made Tsugumai worry about the future. Yuki, on the other hand, didn't know what was going through Tsugumai's mind. He calmly walked toward his goal. This made several people turn their heads to look at him. With his small body, pretty face, and peculiar aura, Yuki stood out in the hall. He was like a swan among chickens, he simply was very different from everyone in that hall. Beautiful lady, would you grant me a dance bowing elegantly, Yuki took Arisa's hand and kissed it like a gentleman. Oh. Yes. Of course. Responding with some nervousness, Arisa blushed a bit. She looked at the cute boy in front of her and had to admit that if he were a few years older, this boy would be an excellent lady killer. She couldn't help but think that if he were a bit older, this boy would be exactly her type. Although she was also a bit curious. Yuki's age was very young from his appearance, so attending this party was not normal. But looking at the young men gathered around her, it wouldn't be a bad idea to use this boy to avoid those annoying rich youths. TCH. However, the small group of suitors clicked their tongues, knowing that, due to the boy's age and appearance, it was very easy for him to dance with any woman in this hall. Arisa was proof, they had been trying to invite her, but now this boy came out of nowhere and took the first dance. Yuki, however, didn't care about any of that. He pulled Arisa out of that group of interested young men to the dance floor. Arisa was a big fish, so big that Yuki wouldn't let her go tonight. So, taking Arisa by the waist, Yuki pulled her body against his, taking a dance pose. Marissa, however, was surprised. She was a bit nervous, and now this boy pulled her forcefully, making Arissa surprised by his strength and bold move. Hello, big sister. Tell me, do you like armadillos? Smiling sweetly, Yuki looked into Arissa's eyes. She, on the other hand, felt a tremor in her gaze. Something inside her felt fear, but she couldn't break free from the boy in front of her. And for a moment, Seeing his smile, Arisa began to regret accepting his invitation. Entangling herself with this boy might be a bad idea. But, not giving her any other option, Yuki started moving to the rhythm of the music. Dash. Guy, who watched Yuki dance with Arisa, didn't know what to think. He saw how Yuki was clearly pressing his body against Arisa very intimately, as if they were lovers. Guy didn't know what Yuki was planning, but still had to praise him. Making a move against Okanaka Haoern's granddaughter requires a lot of courage. However, Guy knew that it was just a show for Yuki. After all, Yuki could sink this ship if he wanted to. But this left many options for Guy. Looking at it from another perspective, Yuki now had a hostage he could use to negotiate if things went wrong. So with a smile, Guy took a tray with several glasses of wine, 
heading toward where Okina was. The negotiations had to begin, but there were no problems, the night was still young. Chapter 86, Okina Kahaurun. Hmm, what a daring boy. Touching his long beard, Okina frowned as he observed everyone in the hall, including his granddaughter. Who was now dancing with a very bold boy. After all, from his perspective, he watched as the boy touched his granddaughter's body here and there. And, of course, he didn't like that. However, he was also surprised because, no matter how handsome and elegant the young man was, if he crossed the line, Arisa would give them a lesson. This had happened before, and Okina was very satisfied with his granddaughter for it. But now, not only did his granddaughter not pull away from the boy, but she even showed signs of blushing on her cheeks. Regardless of the liberties the boy took with her body, this made Okina raise an eyebrow and wonder what kind of ability the boy had to seduce his granddaughter. At the same time, he wondered how much courage the little brat had to seduce his granddaughter in front of him. Despite all this, Okina didn't intervene with his granddaughter, he just watched, wondering where the boy came from and what his identity was. He didn't remember inviting someone like him. Click, click. While watching all this, several of his bodyguards, however, pulled out their weapons, aiming at the intruder in front of them. Stop, or we'll shoot. Hearing this, Okina frowned and looked forward, recognizing the young man in the white tuxedo standing with a tray of wine. Gai Tsutsugimai, I was expecting you. Raising a hand, his bodyguards looked at him for a moment before lowering their weapons. I am honored, Mr. Okina. Nodding, Guy approached fearlessly, taking a seat near Okina. I'm glad you came. I hope you don't mind that I didn't send you an invitation. Not at all, Mr. Okina. It's normal for us not to be invited. I hope you don't mind me entering your party without an invitation either. Ha ha ha, not at all. I trusted you would come anyway. Laughing loudly, Okina looked at Guy. As Yuki had said, this party was too much of a coincidence. Okina hadn't shown himself to the public, and now, out of nowhere, he threw a party this was very strange. But it was understandable. With the threat of the leukocyte eliminated, Okina had nothing to fear from GHQ. So, he made this party specifically to invite Undertaker, the ones responsible for destroying the leukocyte. Rather, he made this party hoping to meet that famous little figure. The Reaper. This was his goal, so just seeing Guy made him a bit disappointed, but nothing outside his expectations. As for why he didn't send an invitation to Undertaker, it was a small test to see if Undertaker had what it took to sneak into this party, outside the quarantine waters, with his bodyguards guarding the ship up and down. But now, seeing Guy, he knew Undertaker had what it took. Well then what brings you here? Although Okina knew why Guy was in this place, he still asked out of courtesy. Guy just smiled, pulling out a small device from his pocket. I would like you to see this first. Oh. Uh. Of course, Okina didn't refuse, he was very curious about the content. So, snapping his fingers, one of his bodyguards took the device and checked the content before passing it to Okina. Okina was surprised, the content of the device contained a video about Yuki and the voids, as well as how they destroyed the leukocytes. All were classified proofs and videos that only he could see. Okina was, of course, satisfied with this. I'm impressed. Who would have thought that these old bones would have the fortune to witness the first superhuman like this? Shaking his head, Okina lamented a bit. After all, if he were 10 or 20 years younger, he was sure he would be happy to fight alongside such a human marvel. Don't be so sad, Mr. Okina. There are many things only you can do. I guess you're right, ha ha ha. Hearing Guy's humble response made Okina smile. So, is the purpose of your visit to seek sponsorship? That is my goal tonight, Mr. Okina. Not denying it, Guy sighed. He had to make sure to get the support of this old man. After all, we have very few supplies to continue our fight with GHQ. I understand. It's very challenging. Nodding, Okina agreed with Guy. Fighting GHQ was not easy, especially for a terrorist group like Undertaker. However, it's a shame that I don't have the honor of meeting His Excellency. Sighing with disappointment, Okina glanced at Guy, hoping he understood the hint. Guy, of course, 
understood. This old man wanted to meet the famous Reaper, to see with his own eyes the being capable of destroying an entire battalion and even destroying the Leucocyte. That can be arranged, Mr. Okina. After all, the Reaper is dancing with your granddaughter right now. Eh. Smiling with amusement, Guy pointed his finger at a certain couple. Okina opened his eyes wide for this, unlike Guy, whose face was well known as the leader of Undertaker, the Reaper, on the other hand, always kept his mask. The only thing they could use to recognize him was his monstrous strength, his small figure, and his special eyes. This was the mark of the Reaper. However, now, Yuki was dancing like a normal person, with no trace of being that monster. Seeing this, Okina made him get up from his seat, now he understood why this boy had so much courage to flirt with his granddaughter in front of him. It turns out he wasn't afraid because he was the most dangerous human on this ship. Thinking about this, Okina sweated a bit, his granddaughter dancing with the Reaper was not a good feeling. However, soon he calmed down, thinking about the Reaper's abilities. If he wanted to kill everyone, it's very likely that he would have already done it. I see, so the rumors that he's still a child are true. How old is he? Returning to his seat, Okina stared fixedly at Guy. Twelve years old. Hearing this, Okina felt his whole body tremble, the Reaper was very young, just as his appearance was still childlike. Thinking about this, Okina knew that Guy was very lucky, to have such a powerful human in his service, and still young. Shaking his head, Okina looked at Yuki, who was dancing with his granddaughter. Yuki was very young, and therefore, also very innocent and naive. Okina didn't know what tricks Guy used to control Yuki, but seeing the couple on the dance floor, an idea flashed in his mind. I'll accept your terms, but with one condition. And what is that condition? Nodding, Guy expected this, with Yuki making a move with his granddaughter, everything was easier. However, he still heard the condition. I want His Excellency down there to marry my granddaughter in the future. What? Chapter 87, You're an Armadillo. Not even in his wildest dreams did Guy expect this from Okina. Guy had no clue what on earth this old man was thinking by proposing such nonsense. Regardless of Yuki's young age, the fact that he was dangerous was beyond doubt. Not to mention, Okina didn't even know him. Offering his granddaughter to a complete stranger made Guy stare intensely at Okina, wondering if he was out of his mind. As for Okina, his thoughts were entirely different from Guy's. He was aware that what he was doing was very risky it was practically a gamble. But if successful, the rewards were limitless. Despite the risk that his conglomerate might be controlled by Undertaker or some other individual in the future, Okina had two objectives in marrying his granddaughter to Yuki. Firstly, since Yuki was still very young, Okina could still influence her life. Seeing his granddaughter closely attached to him, even if it wasn't clear whether it was Guy's order or not, Okina could still use her as honey trap to ensnare Yuki. Looking at Yuki again, Okina nodded satisfied. With his elegance and appearance, adopting him as his grandson wasn't a bad idea. Secondly, it was, of course, Yuki's genes. Okina, like all other countries, coveted his genes. Okina thought that Yuki was the result of an experiment, being a man capable of leaving his seeds to multiple women, ensuring that the next generation would inherit both his strength and power. He didn't know how Guy managed to obtain Yuki, but that didn't matter to Okina. What mattered to him was making his family stronger, and what better way than having his granddaughter lead the next generation to its maximum splendor. I'm afraid I can't promise that, Mr. Okina. With a hand on his head, Guy sighed wearily. After all, Yuki had Inori and Tsugumai as his girlfriends, and Guy honestly didn't want to interfere in Yuki's personal life. There was no benefit, only problems. May I ask why? Not giving up, Okina expected this response. He knew how valuable Yuki was, so Guy's negative answer was within his calculations. It even gave him more confidence in his decision. If Guy refused, it meant that he still didn't have complete control over Yuki, while a positive response would indicate that Guy was hiding something. Mr. Okina, I don't like meddling in the personal lives of my people, so I can't make a decision for this reason. I understand. Nodding, Okina was very satisfied with this response. 
Does that mean you won't intervene if my granddaughter and His Excellency decide to progress in their relationship, correct? That's correct. With a bitter smile on his face, Guy knew where all of this was heading. Ha ha ha, well, very well, then I accept your terms, Guy Tsutsugamai. Laughing heartily, Okina's eyes sparkled, like a child with a huge cake in front of him it would be a shame if Okina let it slip away. Hello, big sister. Tell me, do you like armadillos? Glancing at Guy, who was now heading towards Okina, Yuki smiled at Arisa. Yuki wasn't interested in the business Guy had with Okina or if there was some kind of deal using him as a bridge. He preferred dancing with this beautiful girl rather than talking to an old man. So, holding Arisa tightly by the waist, Yuki asked her with an innocent look on his face. Looking at Yuki, Arisa's body trembled. His words made something inside her start to shake. After all, Yuki's eyes seemed to see through her. No I don't like them. Regaining control slightly, Arisa replied casually. Is that so what a shame. I like armadillos, big sister. Tilting his head slightly, Yuki moved his body. The song was playing, and Yuki didn't want to stand there like an idiot. There was also the risk that Arisa would run away if they didn't dance. You know, big sister. Armadillos are extraordinary. Without averting his gaze from Arisa, Yuki pulled Arisa's body closer to his. They have a tough shell to protect themselves from predators who want to eat them. They never fight, they only protect themselves with their hard shell. That, in part, makes them. Cowards. Arisa's body tensed up. She narrowed her eyes and glared angrily at the boy dancing with her. You. But that's okay. Humans are selfish, and we all have something we must protect. After all, beneath that shell, something very beautiful is hidden. Isn't that right, big sister? Ignoring Arisa's gaze, Yuki rested his head on her chest gently. Yuki was now very satisfied with his height. Being a boy at the beginning of adolescence, his height was small enough for Arisa to be a head taller than him. Arisa didn't know what to say. She had never met someone like the boy in front of her. The boy's eyes seemed to be seeing through her, something she had never experienced before. It was a very strange sensation, but she didn't hate it, in fact, she was beginning to enjoy their conversation. This boy also knew something that others didn't. Arisa, being Okanaka Haoern's granddaughter, always had to be on guard against frauds or those trying to take advantage of her and her fortune. So over the years, she protected herself with a shell always the strict one, with nearly perfect grades and outstanding in sports. She did all this to maintain a facade of being the perfect Arisa, worthy of being Okanaka Haoern's granddaughter. But in doing so, she neglected something crucial she forgot who Arisa Haoern truly was. Big sister, you have a very beautiful heart. Is this what your shell protects? Lifting his head, Yuki took one of Arisa's hands and with a little effort, spun her around, catching her again in his arms, dancing to the rhythm of the music. Big sister, you're an armadillo. Staring at each other, Arisa's cheeks blushed, while Yuki smiled. Chapter 88, A Long Time Ago Tsugimai, who had been listening to the entire conversation, opened her mouth, she couldn't help but tip her hat to Yuki. This guy has a silver tongue and always knows what to say to the ladies, she thought. Gritting her teeth and clenching her fists out of jealousy, Tsugimai hoped Arisa wouldn't be foolish enough to believe Yuki's nonsense. After all, she had been a fool to trust him before and fell into this guy's clutches. On the other hand, Inori didn't know what to think. She was also somewhat annoyed, but if what La Folia said was true, then she should be happy. According to La Folia, a man desired by many women demonstrates his capability and quality. If this man was her boyfriend, she should be happy, knowing she didn't make a mistake and that their descendants would be strong. Ayase, who had joined the duo, just scratched her cheek. Yuki had a sweet mouth, but Ayase didn't want to judge him. She had been wrong before, so she thought that someone as kind as Yuki must have a reason for doing this. And Ayase was right, Yuki did have a motive. His plan was for Arisa to become his financial resource for a small project. Unfortunately, Seagai couldn't assist him in this, but with Arisa on his radar, this would be resolved. 
one could say that at this party, both Yuki and Guy were seeking sponsors Yuki with Arisa and Guy with Okina. Everything balanced. Dash dash. Sister, you're an armadillo. Staring at each other, Yuki took Arisa's hand, pulling her away from the dance floor. Ah uh, where are we going? Despite being confused, Arisa didn't resist and let Yuki take her hand. To a more private place. Looking at his granddaughter leaving hand in hand with Yuki, Okina sighed. This was youth, and he was glad his granddaughter got along with Yuki. The night was still young, and anything could happen. So, raising his wine glass lightly, Okina closed his eyes. Then, if you'll excuse me, I'll be leaving, Mr. Okina. Guy also watched Yuki leave with Arisa. He didn't know Yuki's plans, but it was okay. His mission was complete and he had to go back. Well, don't forget our agreement. I won't, Mr. Okina. Stepping onto the ship's deck, Yuki and Arisa gazed at the sky. It's a very beautiful night, isn't it, big sister? Yes, it is beautiful. Nodding, Arisa shared the same sentiment as Yuki. She looked at the stars while standing on the ship's deck. But this can get exciting. Eh. Swiftly taking Arisa into his arms, Yuki jumped off the ship. He e. Arisa didn't expect this. She tightly gripped Yuki's body and closed her eyes, anticipating the impact, as they were falling into the sea. After a few seconds, the impact didn't come. With uncertainty, she slowly opened her eyes, surprised by what was happening. Yuki was standing on the water. This. This is impossible. Muttering in shock, Arisa opened her eyes wide. Nothing is impossible, big sister. Smiling slightly, Yuki looked at the girl in his arms. He wanted to see this expression on her face. Who? What are you? Only now did Arisa begin to doubt Yuki's identity. Standing on the water was magical. I'm just a damn liar. With a mocking smile, Yuki activated his sherry non. So, I hope you forgive me for this, big sister. I promise to make it up to you for everything tonight. Eh. Staring into her eyes, Arisa's eyelids closed for a moment. Yuki used Genjutsu. He didn't know if it would work on people in this world, but seeing Arisa fall for it, his concerns vanished. I'm sorry, but all of this must end. Kissing her for it, Yuki looked up at the starry sky. The end was near, and there were still many things he had to do. What he just did was low, but there were things that had to be done. Despite being in a shell, Arisa still had weaknesses, but her heart was innocent. So, Yuki decided to make it up to her tonight. With a smile on his face, Yuki walked slowly on the water, while Arisa's eyelids trembled, opening her eyes. And what happened? Nothing, big sister. Do you want to hear a story? A story? Yes, a long, long time ago, the largest ship in history set sail for New York, USA. Its name was the Titanic. Walking without caring about the direction, Arisa was so engrossed in the story that she completely forgot they were no longer on the ship but walking slowly on the water, while the ship slowly drifted away from them. The next morning, he woke up between Inori's arms. Tsukumai was very angry with him because of his little romance with Arisa the night before. Therefore, Tsukumai didn't let him into her room that night, leaving Yuki defenseless. Fortunately, Inori gladly opened her room for him, so sleeping alone was no longer an option. Soon, this will end, huh? Touching Inori's cheeks, Yuki smiled sweetly. Don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you, my lovely Eva. Then. Our next mission is to go to the beach. Listening to Guy, Tsukumai rolled her eyes. They were a group of terrorists. What did the beach have to do with it isn't that fine we need to relax and rest. Besides, I'm sure Ayase wants to feel the sea. Right, Ayase. Responding to Tsugumai, Yuki smiled at her. Hump. Tsugumai, however, looked away, refusing to look at him, she was still upset. Ayase blushed a bit. Yuki was right, now that she could walk, she was a bit excited to run on the sand and feel the sea water on her feet. Yuki, on the other hand, just scratched his cheek. Two days had passed since the party, but Tsugumai was still angry. 
Yuki had already explained his reason for doing these things, but Tsugumai refused to believe him. She thought it was just another excuse from Yuki to expand his crystal palace further. That's why her room was still closed. Allowing Inori to sleep with Yuki. Although Yuki didn't complain about it, he was very comfortable sleeping with Inori now. After all, Inori's body was very warm, even though he was tempted several times to take the next step in their relationship, he stopped. Unlike Tsugumai, Inori had yet to understand the true meaning of sex. Unfortunately for Yuki, he still didn't know that Inori was already well informed on the subject. After all, the internet is a vast world with versatile information. Inori was also waiting for the same thing as Yuki. She had heard about the intimacy between Tsugumai and him, so she also wanted to take the next step. Unfortunately for Yuki, Inori was too embarrassed to ask for something like that, and Yuki, still thinking that Inori needed to learn about sex, didn't take the initiative. They were just a couple of fools who didn't understand each other. Chapter 89 Vacation. Is it okay for us to go on vacation? Ayase couldn't believe it and couldn't help but ask, Guy just sighed in response. It's not a vacation, Ayase. It's part of our mission. But. It's fine, isn't it working too hard isn't good either. Unlike Ayase, who had doubts, Yuki simply stretched his arms in approval. But is it really necessary? I don't see how an ordinary student can help us. Tsugumai, shaking her head, shared the same opinion as Ayase. Although their terrorist group included many students, each of them was a seasoned war veteran. However, bringing an ordinary high school student seemed excessive. Yes, he is the key to this mission. Nodding, Guy looked at the entire group in front of him. Is it his void? Then Yuki, on the other hand, wasn't surprised. It was natural since, besides using his void, Yuki couldn't see how an ordinary high school boy could be useful. That's correct, it's his void. Confirming his words, Guy made Yuki smile. But I have doubts. What's in Oshima that requires this particular guy's void? This was the crucial part, this guy's void was something special, more like a master key, the power to unlock any lock. It was a seemingly useless void, but in the hands of a thief, it became powerful. That's why Yuki was a bit curious. In Oshima, the key to ending this is located. Oh squinting his eyes, a glint flashed in Guy's eyes. Please. Let it come out. Let it come out. Carefully turning a wooden wheel, a black-haired teenager nervously watched the wooden wheel. Tleek tleek. Congratulations. You've won a trip for four to Oshima. Ringing his bell loudly, the shopkeeper smiled at the teenager, who in complete astonishment, looked at the small golden ball that came out of the wooden wheel. Oh yes. 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 Unable to contain his excitement, the teenager jumped for joy. This was definitely his lucky day, after all, traveling to Oshima meant a vacation. Here you go, young man. Thank you, thank you so much. Quickly taking the tickets from the shopkeeper, the teenager bowed before running and jumping with joy. So. That Suda Tamadate, observing him from a distance of about 500 meters, Yuki smiled. This was the guy guy needed for his void. Is it really necessary to go through all this can't we just kidnap him? Unlike Yuki, who found amusement in watching the boy, Argos sighed. He didn't understand why they had to go through all this trouble just to take this guy to Oshima. Fine, that guy is innocent. We can't go around kidnapping people, and besides, Relaxing isn't so bad, right, Guy? Turning his head to Guy, who was sipping on some juice, Yuki responded to Argos's question. Yes, Yuki is right. Not denying Yuki's words, Guy continued to calmly drink his juice. By the way, I also want to go on that trip. However, Yuki's words made Guy's glass start to tremble. And why? Looking at Yuki in astonishment, Guy was confused, he didn't know why Yuki wanted to join Sudatamidate. After all, he was just a normal guy, easily found anywhere. Why not it'll be fun? You know, that guy is a fan of Inora. Haha, <laughs> I wonder what expression he'll have when he sees her in person. With a smile on his face, Yuki looked toward Suda, who was still jumping for joy. Guy, on the other hand, sighed. He didn't know what Yuki was planning, 
but judging by his smile, he just wanted to play. Besides, when the time comes to take the void, wouldn't it be more convenient if I'm nearby? Casting a sidelong glance at Kai, Yuki patted Argos on the shoulder, who just looked at Sudo with compassionate eyes. Despite the short time they knew each other, Argos knew that if anything or anyone entered Yuki's radar, that something or someone would be in trouble. Well, I'll make the arrangements. Shaking his head, Guy gave in. He only needed that guy's void, so with Yuki nearby, the chances of success were 100%. We're going to the beach. With a smile on his face, Yuki looked at the three girls in front of him. Tsugumai, Inorai, and Ayase glanced at each other. They didn't know how Yuki managed to convince Guy of this, but that didn't stop a smile from appearing on Tsugumai and Ayase's faces. But is it okay isn't it too much for the mission? Don't worry, this time the mission is easy. Besides, we need some fun too. Yay. You're the best. Jumping into Yuki's arms with excitement, for a moment, Tsugumai forgot all her anger. Ayase was excited too. Now that she could walk again, feeling the sea with her feet was no longer a dream. As for Inorai, she just tilted her head. She didn't know what the sea was, but seeing the trio excited made her look forward to Oshima. So, we can swim and play as much as we want. Yes. Supporting Yuki's excitement, Tsugumai couldn't help but give him a kiss. She was tired of all the missions and fights with GHQ, so excitedly, she forcefully kissed Yuki. Yuki, on the other hand, smiled inside, his plans were going perfectly. He didn't care about Suda and the mission. The reason he was excited was that he could see his beloved girlfriends in swimsuits, not to mention Ayase, who had the sexiest body of the three. After all, Tsugumai was only 14 years old, while Inorai stood out more with her beautiful white skin and delicate body. So, he couldn't wait to go to Oshima. This was Yuki's main goal. The fact that Tsugumai forgot her anger was a bonus. Seeing Tsugumai kissing Yuki, Inorai frowned a bit before approaching and hugging one of his arms. Hee hee, come here, sweetheart. Separating from Tsugumai, Yuki kissed Inorai, who still felt jealous of Tsugumai. Ayase just shook her head at this, she felt very hurt every time she saw the trio show affection in public. But what could she do join in and form a quartet ha ha ha. Smiling at this, Ayase was excited, looking forward to the upcoming vacation. Chapter 90, Dear Guests Whoa a a What a huge ship! Staring in complete awe at the ship in front of him, a black-haired teenager opened his mouth. Yes, it's amazing. Agreeing with his words was a brown-haired teenager with brown eyes. Looking at the ship in front of them with excitement, they attended satisfied, the journey hadn't even started, but it was already thrilling. However, you're very lucky, Tamadate Kun, winning this trip. You've surely used up all your luck for the next 10 years. Adjusting her glasses, a short-haired black-haired girl of about 17 or 18 said, looking disdainfully at the excited boy in front of her. However, her eyes also gleamed with excitement, the ship was indeed very large. Come on, it's not that big a deal, right you? Approaching with a smile, a brown-haired girl with two pigtails tied with red ribbons said. She looked at the brown-haired boy when she spoke those words, but like the trio, she was also amazed. Even if I've used up my luck, it's still worth it. On the other hand, the black-haired teenager didn't care. He clenched his fists, a smile forming on his face. He had won something for the first time in his life, something amazing like an all-expenses-paid trip for four to the beaches of Oshima. Therefore, he didn't hesitate to invite his best friend, Shuima and Yahiro Samukawa, being part of the same club and classmates. Suda thought it was better to enjoy this trip with friends. It's a pity that Yahiro couldn't attend, leaving two free spots. But for better or worse, the black-haired girl, Kanan Kizuma, heard about the trip, forcing Suda to give her a ticket. And, of course, she didn't forget her best friend, Hair Menjo. With them, the quartet was decided. All right, what are we waiting for let's go. Turning his head, Suda ran excitedly to the ship. Wait for me. Not before she ran after him. HMP. Men. Shaking her head, Kanan sighed before following them. Hair, 
on the other hand, scratched her cheek. She, like Suda, was excited. However, her excitement was different as she had been stealing glances at Shu. Shu, however, was so excited about the ship that he didn't notice Hare's gaze. We've arrived. We've arrived. What a good day. I'm glad it's not raining. After a few hours, they had arrived. Looking around with starry eyes, it had been a long time since they could go on vacation. With the apocalypse virus and the quarantine zone, it was very difficult for ordinary people to move around. That's why once he won the strip, Suda got excited and didn't hesitate to use the tickets. Now I remember. Shu, you lived in this place, right turning his gaze, Suda looked at Shu with high expectations. Really? Kano also looked at Shu, and even Hare held her hands, awaiting the answer. Yes. It was when I was still a child. Feeling the pressure from his friends, Shu scratched his cheek. And Yosh. Then it's decided. Shu will be our guide. Crossing his arms, Suda agreed satisfied. Kano also agreed, she, like Suda, thought it would be more exciting with a guide. You guys. Letting out a tired sigh, Shu didn't know what to think. It's true he lived in Oshima, but it had been a long time, and many things had changed, so being a guide wasn't suitable for someone like him. All right, Shu, it'll only be for three days. Hare. Touching his shoulder with a smile, Hare tried to cheer him up. Shu, on the other hand, felt his burden becoming heavier. After all, he also wanted to play on the beach, and being a tour guide wasn't cool. Not to mention, he still had to visit a particular person. However, as they continued their conversation, a beautiful woman with long black hair, dressed in a purple yukata, approached them. You must be the winners of the jet spa. With a professional smile on her face, the woman bowed. A moment of uncomfortable silence passed through the group. After all, the beautiful woman in front of them had a magnificent aura of a very high-class maid. Her posture, her elegance these were not things an ordinary person could have. Cough cough. However, Suda gathered his courage to break the awkward silence. But there was something more, with this lovely Oni-san, this trip was becoming even more interesting. Thank you. My name is Suda Tamadate. I'm Shu. Shu Ima. Kanan Miyosuma. Um. Hair Menjo. Introducing themselves one by one, Shana smiled. She could see Suda's nervousness and the curiosity of the girls. But it didn't matter, she was here with a special mission, and that was to attend to a special young man. However, she looked at the whole group and couldn't find him. He hasn't come, but with that in mind, she decided to wait, her mistress would be angry if she found out she didn't wait for the young man. All right, if it's not too much trouble, would you mind waiting for the other winners they shouldn't be long. Other winners. Tilting his head in confusion, Suda asked. He didn't think there were other winners. The same was for Shu, Kanan, and Hare. Just the luxury boat trip was enough for it to be a prize, not to mention the three days of stay. For the cost of four people, it must be significant, let alone eight. This fact made the group wonder if they really hit the jackpot. Yes, dear guests. Our company made two golden tickets for eight people in total. Answering with a smile, Shana looked at the group before looking towards the ship. Oh. The other guests have arrived. Turning their heads, the group was also curious about the other winners. However, very soon, both Suda and Shu were paralyzed. They looked in amazement at the group approaching them. No, they were looking at one person in particular in that group. While Hare and Kanan just attended, unlike the duo of men, they weren't surprised. After all, they were just other winners. Welcome to Oshima, dear guests. With a bow, Shana greeted the incoming group, checking again. She found a young man without any problem. We've been waiting for you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Of course, the incoming group was Yuki, Ayase, Inorai, and Tsugumai. Looking slightly at Suda's group, Yuki smiled. He could see Suda and Shu's astonished faces, this was expected. After all, this was fun. 